Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Praveen Kilimsetti from a Twitter team. Uh, we are part of the uh, data platform organization inside Twitter, responsible for data ingestion and replication. Uh, hi, folks. I'm uh, Jin Zhao, uh, also from the Twitter, the Twitter, Twitter Life Cycle team. Thank you. Uh, we have a tight agenda today. Um, so <clears throat> we'll introduce uh, what we do in our team and how we serve uh, internal Twitter teams as a customers. Uh, and then we talk about uh, uh, challenges in our replication and ingestion pipeline in last two years and how we address them, how we re-architected our batch pipeline to address those challenges as well as our ingestion, real-time ingestion pipeline how we address those challenges. Um, so I'll, I'll start with uh, intro and give the challenges that we faced and uh, cover the batch replication story. And uh, Jinja will take over and cover the real-time ingestion part of the talk. OK, so uh, we, our org name is Data Lifecycle Team, which is responsible for uh, data ingestion. Um, so as you, as you interact with Twitter app or website, uh, millions or billions of events generated to our ingestion pipeline for analytics. And we own and serve uh, offline ingestion to our data lakes and also own real-time ingestion uh, pipeline to GCS and BigQuery. Apart from ingestion, we also own uh, replication story for uh, Twitter as well. We have several data lakes uh, HDFS at on-prem data center, GCS in cloud, and BigQuery as our data warehouse. Uh, batch replication between the data lakes and between the data lake and data warehouse and between key value stores to uh, BigQuery um, was the main charter for the replication. And our team also responsible for metadata layer, which serves all the analytics data, uh, discovery, metadata management, um, auditing, and whatnot. Right. And apart from the uh, uh, metadata service, we also manage huge Hadoop, Hadoop clusters uh, in our data centers and also responsible for uh, managing retention configuration in a unified way between HDFS, GCS, and BigQuery. OK, so what are the challenges uh, we faced in the last two years? Why are we here to talk about our work, right? Um, the first one is the data compliance issues. Uh, so with GDPR compliance, when users of Twitter makes changes to their profile um, or changes, uh, make changes in a way that they want to remove some of the personal information, our account gets deactivated. We need to remove that personal information within X number of days after that action to keep uh, privacy and uh, privacy of the users uh, uh, in line and also make sure we are compliant with the guidelines provided to us. So this breaks our analytics data model. Uh, traditionally, analytics data is write once semantics. You write once into our data lakes or data warehouse, they're never modified. Um, uh, but with this, we need to scrub our data every now and then and modify it and rewrite it. So you're converting our data model from um, write once to uh, multi-version writes kind of a model. So that broke many of our uh, retention and replication assumptions that we had in our uh, services that we built over the time. That's one of the biggest challenge we need to solve. And the second one is that as we adapted to Google Cloud, our traditional batch pipelines, which used to take one, two hours to deliver data into HDFS, taking four to six hours to replicate it to GCS and then eventually to BigQuery, that's not acceptable either. And then, since we didn't have a managed offering for ingestion and replication, many of our customer teams, uh, internal Twitter teams, built their own pipelines, bring up Beam pipelines, uh, to ingest data into BigQuery. Um, they, bring, they pick up a templated code, run the job, and it usually takes two to four days to bring it up, uh, up online and then maintain it, like any schema change, redeploy. So if I'm a data engineer, I just want to know how to read my data. I don't want to manage all this infra for in my team. So that's one of the pain points that we wanted to solve. And finally, as we started adopting new and new technologies, our number of services that we are building over the time increased as well. For every source and destination combination, we had a separate replication tool to a point where we need to simplify right now. 
so with that uh, challenges we listed down okay well, how should we change our replication and nijesh architecture to handle those problems first and fourth thing first first and foremost we need to make sure data should be available in the required destinations in a very simple way for data engineers to consume it and they should be able to just go to some ui or gui or cli and tell okay here is my data for example anhydrated tweets is one data set i want that data to be available in hdfs gcs and bigquery and they should be able to give their replication topology as a configuration we should be able to bring up the pipelines in the background and provide data delivery with certain slas so that's for our first goal we kept in mind and second one is we want this to be a managed offering we don't want customers to manage their pipelines instead we manage that pipeline and provide data for customers with a specified slos and it should be qos aware so that uh, tier 0 pipelines can use more resources than tier 2 pipelines and uh, similarly the whole gdpr compliance issue that i was talking should be automatically managed by the replication and ingestion layers customers doesn't need to worry about their data is compliant or not and then finally we need to integrate with other platform integrations for example when we replicate the data metadata has to be replicated either as well and we should be scrubbing aware provide the charge back only data set owners should have a um, uh, authority to um, configure the replication and retention and if the whole architecture should be extendable so that when we add new systems let's say aws s3 in future or something else like big table we should be able to provide that ingestion and replication mechanism easily without rewriting entire thing so with that goals we started working on two projects uh, one is paro other one is data life cycle manager i'll give a little bit intro about what these projects are uh, sparrow is a real time ingestion pipeline um, that um, ingests the data from twitter services to our analytics sinks in re near real time so as you interact with twitter application uh, those requests go to our internal services and those twitter services emit bunch of log events so that they'll be useful for our analytics workload so the sparrow ingestion is built uh, to support large scale aggregations and real time ingestion to bigquery and gcs and then on the other hand data life cycle manager was designed to do a batch replication whether you write data in one location or more it should continuously keep that data in sync between data lakes and data warehouse and key value stores not one time but continuously so i'll explain how that works and uh, for rest of the talk we'll divide into deep dive into dlm which is data life cycle manager and then deep dive into sparrow <coughs> so now let's explain a little bit about what is the data compliance problem that i was talking about so in general let's say you have data written um, at one location called hdfs and that let's call that as a right face you have a data producing job or ingestion job that is writing data in one place it will be replicated to rest of the locations based on user need but then it gets changed again it's changed from sorry it's changed from v1 to v2 here um so that means after a certain period of time let's say a month uh, there were some user actions happened on that data set that requires to let's say remove the location information from the profile or or something else or contact number and what not right so we need to rewrite the data by removing some columns and rows out of that data and rewrite it and rewrite and write it back to one of the locations and the scrubbing could happen in a different place than the initially the data was originated and that data has to be re-replicated to rest of the locations so that data at all locations are compliant with respect to gdpr so now as we create a new version of data that will be replicated to rest of the locations but we cannot delete the old data right away because there might be a jobs that are consuming the old version so we need to wait for them to cool off and then only delete so this kind of uh, breaks are traditional um, <clears throat> um batch pipelines for replication and ingest and retention the reason for that is batch pipelines were configured to work at a time interval let's say 10 am data is ready replicate it wait for 11 am data and then replicate it right similarly retention works at okay my ttl is one year so delete the data which is older than one year but here we are talking about delete the data which is older than one year 
and also delete the data which is uh, no more compliant with respect to a GDPR. That means older versions has to be knocked out either. So we need to change the way we need to think about how to orchestrate these jobs. So that's when we went ahead with metadata-driven lifecycle managing. That means we're not looking for a path-based polling or a time-based polling. Instead, it should be metadata-driven. We have we, we have improved our metadata layer to capture all the information. Uh, the basic unit of uh, information here is segment, which generally means a chunk of a data set generally maps to a time interval or a version. And we added versioning there. Like I mentioned in the previous slide, v1, v2. So kind of starts with version 1 and goes um, uh, forever. And then when the version changes, we need our metadata layer to be very much updated and so that we can listen to our metadata service and build beam-based pipelines or yarn-based pipelines based on the new request. So with that, um, we, uh, we realized, okay, we need to go ahead with uh, metadata-managed replication and ingestion and retention. And also, as I mentioned, we, need, we have an opportunity to simplify. Here is like a simple, a uh, slide that shows how many services we have for each source and destination. Definitely, this is not scalable. A lot of customer teams need to interact with uh, different tools based on their need. So we wanted to move away from this kind of a model to a unified story. So the, what is the unified story here? You have underlying storage systems in the bottommost layer here. And you want a, uh, we want to design a replication and retention layer on top of these storage systems that listens to what's happening into the metadata layer and then perform the replication. And this replication has to be managed service, comes with production SLOs, and you define the quality of service and customers should be able to provision the replication by simple CLI or GUI, and also provide unified monitoring for the data set level. They should be able to see the metrics at a data set level where they are and how much data being replicated, what is the chargeback, and also, scrubbing happens underneath. So data is keep changing in one locations, it automatically sync to the other locations. So let's see how this works internally. Let's say I'm the data set owner. Um, I interact with a GUI or CLI to specify, here is my replication topology. I have my data in HDFS, I want the data in GCS and BigQuery. He interacts with our metadata layer, and that's when our metadata layer knows about replication topology. At the same time, these are the other data producers that are writing data to one of these locations. Either it's a log pipeline, or user data jobs, or scrubbing framework, which is writing to one of these uh, locations, registers their metadata. So we want, um, uh, we implemented the versioning layer in this metadata layer, and it gets incremented whenever a segment uh, state is changed. Um, and we have built a service called Event Generator, which listens to this metadata layer. Metadata layer is a SQL store. And every time a transaction happens, we maintain a history of transactions. And we have a polling service lis which listens to these history of events and pushes those events to our messaging system in a non-lossy way. So at this point, our messaging system knows what happened to a data set for a location so that we can act on them uh, at uh, using other uh, services that we have, which is coordinator is another service that's a centralized job manager, which reads these uh, metadata events and then looks at our replication topology and then builds the jobs accordingly. So once you have the jobs uh, built, uh, managed or persisted in the coordinator service, uh, we have one or more different types of actual replicators, uh, for example, if you are replicating from HDFS to GCS, you don't need to do any transformations. It's a bitwise copy. So we could use a simple distributed copy in Hadoop framework for that. But if you're moving data between key value stores to BigQuery or data lakes to BigQuery, we need to do transformations. That's where we use Beam. And in the whole process, right, the Beam is not visible to customers. What, what we want is that customers to not worry about how we orchestrate the Beam jobs and how data ingestion is done. They should be just worried about data being available in their locations, right? So in the in the destination. So the, that's where the transformation executors comes in, and they convert the data and then ingest to BigQuery. And 
for conversion, we need a bunch of metadata, how the data is serialized, what is the type of the data. So all that, we get that information as a replication configuration, or, or we derive it from our metadata layer. So let's dig a little bit more into what does Beam Replicator does, right? So our Beam Replicator uh, responsible for uh, reading uh, the metadata events from um, uh, coordinator. And uh, once it knows the job, it now needs to know how to deploy this job in, in, um, uh, in data flow. Basically, bring, uh, like derive the Beam job parameters from the metadata layer as well as the configuration. And at this point, we need to worry about the schema, how this data is uh, schema evolution is done. So the Beam job first, uh, before even going to the copy, it first verifies the uh, metadata is correct or not. For example, I was asked to replicate uh, V1 version to V2 version to BigQuery. Now, first thing to verify is V2 version is latest. If so, is my destination version is lower than the V2 so that I can do actual replication. Otherwise, we'll end up replacing the older data, newer data with older data, right? So we do those checks. Once we know the version that we are uh, uh, we are working on is actually a latest version. That's when the beam job gets deployed. And the beam job, first thing it does is that loading the schema from our a schema um, information from the GCS bucket. The schema information in GCS buckets gets updated whenever user changes the schema for the data. And uh, we dynamically load that information. That way, user doesn't need to worry about redeploying their pipelines or anything. It gets automatically updated. and and uh, dynamically, we load the schema. Uh, generally, our schema is stored as a, we use thrift for our schema, and we uh, generate the Java and Scala uh, generated files for the schema. And this particular job loads the Java schema and uh, converts that to Avro schema so that we can ingest it to BigQuery. So at this point, you have the schema available. Now read the data using Elephant Bird IO or Hadoop IO. And, uh, convert the thrift to Avro bytes. Now, once the thrift to Avro bytes conversion is done, we could ingest the data to BigQuery as is, but we want many customers to give the option to change that data in line. For example, as I mentioned, there are hundreds of jobs that are customers deploying using custom pipelines where they don't want raw data to be in BigQuery. They want to filter few columns and insert them to BigQuery. So, so basically, you we take that expression of information of what they want uh, the, to be done with the data, either as a simple user data function or as a SQL-like expression saying uh, SQL, uh, basically you want to insert as a few columns, right? So you can take the select column one, column two, column three as an information and we deploy the UDF jobs internally. And that becomes one of the DAG, uh, one of the step in the DAG uh, in this beam job. So once the UDF converts it to required part, uh, required format uh, is when we insert into BigQuery. We use BigQuery IO connector for these batch jobs. And once the job is completed, we uh, turn back to metadata layer and commit the version. <coughs> so today we support a bunch of uh, uh, different formats, uh, uh, Thrift, Avro, et cetera. But we notice that when we are replicating data from our key value store to BigQuery or BigQuery to key value store, we had a gap of information about metadata about the, uh, metadata about how the data is serialized. For example, here is a simple key value data set that has a key of integer and the value is of a structure. But our metadata layer knows that this is a thrift data, but doesn't know how this is serialized because when it is stored in a key value store, it's a blob of binary key and binary value. We don't know how to interpret it. But when you move that data to BigQuery, it's a table row, essentially. So you, what we did was instead of, again, customers to build their own pipelines, we added a simple mechanism to provide the codec information as a simple annotation in the schema. And we pick up that annotation from the schema and then know how to serialize this data, deserialize this data. So this is a, like a glimpse of how our self-serve looks like. So you, you're a data set owner. You can go to this GUI and select a list of destinations that you want their data and set up backfill window and also set up uh, retention similarly in the next uh, another, uh, another screen. And now you're done. Your data is 
uh, your data replication story is complete, retention story is complete, and we will uh, deliver the data within the SLO. Again, this GUI also takes the what QoS tier you want this data to be available. So this product uh, is in production for almost three quarters, and uh, it's adopted internally within the Twitter, almost 150 teams uh, using it, and we have 1,000 plus pipelines. Um, a good volume of data, but still, um, we are at a point where we we are migrating all the existing services into this one and start retiring the older ones. So that those are the next things that are working on. First one is that uh, uh, complete the UDF functionality that I was just talking, um, and then uh, uh, migrate all our existing pipelines. We have around 600 uh, custom pipelines that needs to be migrated. Once the UDF functionality is ready we need to start working on automation. Uh, right now, we are working on automating all the uh, pipelines which don't do any transformations, just raw ingestion. Those are in progress. But once that is done, uh, we'll unify most of our pipelines and remove, retire the old services. Um, and also, uh, the next thing we, we can do is that cost and performance improvements. Though this is a continuous improvements, the good thing is that once all the replications are under one roof, any improvements will have a huge returns for the Twitter. So we know that uh, one of our schema library that we use for converting Thrift to uh, Avro is a reflection-based library. It uses little more CPU than it could. So we want to move to uh, ASD-based uh, uh, conversion where you, you will not use reflection-based library and save some CPU time. Uh, that's one thing that we need to do. And then also today to replicate data from HDFS to BigQuery, we do a multi-hop replication, which is unnecessary for the customers who doesn't need their data in GCS. They just want data between HDFS and BigQuery. So we could uh, write our Beam jobs to uh, connect to our on-prem clusters and directly read the data. So we're working on networking uh, permissions, et cetera, there. Um, so that that's at high level what we are doing next. But just to give a recap, right? So. Uh, traditionally, as I mentioned, instead of customers to build the pipelines on their own, now we are providing a unified way to manage the replication as well as retention and able to deploy the pipelines dynamically based on the most of the information that we get from metadata information as well as from replication topology. And the data scrubbing is automatically taken care because um, uh, <clears throat> because you are listening to the metadata layer and then whether the data is gen data is committed for a 10 a.m. data or one year old data, it really doesn't matter, right? For us, it's an event stream. We just process the event stream and complete it. So that's all I have for batch replication story. And uh, now Jinja will take over the Sparrow ingestion. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Jinja. Thanks, Prabhi. Uh, I will take it from here and talk about log ingestion. So first, I want to make sure we are on the same page about what is log ingestion. For log ingestion, we are, uh, actually talk about the stack, uh, which collect data, you know, and uh, send the data to the destination, um, like uh, BigQuery and GCS for data platform analytics. And the data uh, from the high level, there are two sorts of data. One source of data is the data we collected from the iOS apps, like when you click uh, as in our iOS app. Uh, the other set of data is the data generated, uh, generated on our server side, internal server side. For example, we have a k-value store. When the cavity is stored, it generates a response or uh, some uh, other things. They want to keep the info for analytics. So uh, this is the, uh, what is the law pipeline. And uh, uh, at Twitter, we group the data into the data sets, the data set concept. You know, a data set is the, the, the data. For example, the data we collect from the as click is a data set. So um, at Twitter, if we want to build a top uh, pipeline, first we have to handle the scale of Twitter. So what is the scale of Twitter? Uh, we have about a three to five billion events per minute, and uh, uh, it's like a 10 to 12 terabytes traffic per minute. And these traffic are not divided evenly. There are some huge uh, data sets, there are some small data sets. The huge data sets, they could have uh, up to like uh, uh, 10 to uh, 18 uh, gigabytes uh, throughput per second. And it is like uh, 35 to uh, 43 million events per minute. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, like more than 1 million uh, internal uh, clients, uh, say producers. 
sending data to our log injection system. So if we want to build a log pipeline, we have to solve this uh, skill, uh, this uh, skill of the uh, data and also the, the producers. We used to have a historical pipeline. It is a batch-based uh, batch pipeline. Uh, it, it will take hours to deliver the data to the user specified location. For example, HDFS in one data center, uh, GCS or BigQuery. And uh, this pipeline is uh, mainly running on prime. Uh, it, it is running on prime in our uh, local data center, uh, and it is built on top of uh, you know some uh, uh, batch stack like uh, Hadoop, TAS, which is a MapReduce framework, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Mesos. Uh, so uh, and this pipeline it doesn't have support for cloud uh, generated data. So uh, we want to evolve our pipeline. And here are the goals we want to do with our, uh, how, how we want to evolve our pipeline. First, we want to, the pipeline be able to handle our skill. It, it should be able to handle our current skill. It should be able to handle the goal of like 50% year to year growth. You know, it's like, for example, it's 5 million at the peak uh, this year, then maybe like, uh, uh, you know, more than 10 million after two years, uh, our pipeline should be able to be handled and the, be, uh, be, be, be able to scale. Uh, and then we want to provide the streaming ability to our uh, new pipeline. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slides, it will, might take hour to hours to, to deliver the data. Now we want to add uh, you know, in seconds, minutes. Uh, and then we want the new pipeline to be more cloud native. Uh, by being cloud native, we, uh, we, uh, it have two, uh, two points. First, we want to make sure the pipeline could run on, uh, on cloud in the cloud environment. Second is we want to uh, adopt some uh, technologies which is more friendly, uh, more cloud native. Uh, for example, Beam, uh, DataFlow, yeah, these technologies. So uh, the fourth uh, point I want to mention here is about the compatibility. If we want to build the uh, pipeline because of skill and uh, uh, we mentioned another problem, we want to it, uh, it is compatible with existing pipeline and the migration should be very friendly. And the compatibility, it could be uh, inter interpreted in three uh, aspects. First is the producer uh, uh, compatibility. We have more than 1 million clients. For the producer side, uh, they should be <laughs> able to uh, publish the data in all the way. They, they shouldn't you know, just change their code. Uh, that won't work because it's like from hundreds of teams. Uh, the second is the consumer compatibility. So though we want to enable streaming, but for there are so many old pipelines, old, old ETL jobs, they still pro uh, produce, uh, uh, consume the data by scouting, MapReduce, Presto. We want to maintain this compatibility. Then the third is the data uh, management compatibility. So in the past, uh, also Premier also mentioned, we organized the data, uh, let's say on HDFS in our segment like it's layout is year, month, day, hour, and we want to maintain its compatibility so it's easier for users. Then the last I want to uh, uh, mention is we want to support the user-defined function. Uh, On-prem, in our test pipeline, we have the user-defined uh, support. We find it pretty useful for some light uh, transform, and we want to continue to support it in our new pipeline. So with these goals and requirements in mind, uh, we build a project called Spiral. Uh, Spiral is a project, uh, you know, like uh, uh, we mentioned, we want a streaming availability it has. Uh, we, want a, uh, we want it to be cloud native, it is cloud native. I will talk more about it later. Uh, later. And uh, we want to support trans transparent migration. Uh, we want to support UDF, it also has it. Uh, besides that, uh, uh, like DRM, it, it is also a managed solution. It means the users, they don't have to maintain the job. Uh, it's actually just a configuration for them. You know, once it's running, they don't have to worry about the quota, uh, alerts, uh, 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 security, and other issues. And at Twitter, uh, we take the pri private data protection very seriously. So we have a standard of a private data uh, uh, protection. So our pipeline is also uh, PD uh, private uh, PDB, uh, private data protection compliant. Uh, we also build a, you know, a, a set of tools to support a chargeback and the cost estimation before users onboard it. So uh, 
here's a comparison of our spiral pipeline with our historical pipeline. In our old, uh, previous pipeline, it might take, uh, let's say, uh, we, if we want to ingest data to BigQuery, in the past, it like uh, take, uh, you know, two or three hours for some very huge data sets, which have, you know, terabytes, uh, tens of terabytes per, per hour, it might even take longer. But with the new pipeline, it will like uh, uh, take minutes. For, uh, for some small data sets, uh, uh, or some uh, data sets which is not, is not that big, like 100 megabytes, or, few, uh, or even gigabytes, like, uh, it, it might be able to achieve a uh, uh, second. So um, next, I want to go to the architecture of our pipeline. From the high level, we, uh, uh, our uh, spiral could be divided into four components. First is the uh, clients. Uh, which generate the data. Like I said, the data could be from our uh, from our iOS apps, like from when you click us in our uh, Twitter app, or some internal uh, data generated by our internal servers. The second is the streaming aggregation layer, which has you know Flume, Kafka pops up. So uh, the this layer is just like uh, aggregated data from the one million or even more cans, just batch them and do some other things filtering and routing. Uh, uh, then the third component is the stream processing layer. Uh, this layer, we use the Beam uh, and the Google Data Flow uh, and Airflow to build it. This is like just to process the data before deliver the data to the destination users want and then deliver data in the format user want. For example, if users want the packet format, they want the script LD format, they want data in the BigQuery format. I just sit down in the processing layer. So let's go, uh, go through them one by one. First is the, the ingestion layer. Uh, for now, we have data both generated from on-prem and uh, on cloud. For on-prem, uh, the, the data is usually come from Mesos, then they send it from Kafka. Now we, uh, we, we have uh, the those injection connectors sending the data to pops up. And, uh, on cloud, the data could from Kubernetes and the community engine. It also get a, a send data to, to pops up. So uh, this is a high level uh, uh, picture of the, the uh, our injection and aggregate layer. So there's just a few points I want to mention here. First, we have the transparent support to existing traffic. Uh, we did uh, some uh, thing from the f to bridge uh, flow to pops up and uh, and. Uh, uh, so uh, existing users, they, 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 they want to even feel it. it is, uh, if they want their data to pop up on the BigQuery, it will uh, just uh, happen transparently. And we also build a unified kind of library for users. Uh, no matter you are generating the data from on-prem and on-cloud, if you use our kind of library, you, you will see the same API. You want to feel whether the backend is a, is a flow uh, or, 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 or the pops up. Uh, uh, yeah, just use our client. It will take uh, the credential, uh, also the credentials, uh, uh, authentication, and the, the, the same API. Uh, so the third, uh, another thing I want to mention is our we have a meta, uh, metadata management system to uh, to uh, make pop pop up uh, pluggable. So even we use pop up. But it's actually plug uh, pluggable. If we want to change it to pop up light or any other system. Uh, it's actually uh, 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 not hard for us because our metadata system have our uh, own abstraction of data set, and the users when they see data, they only see you know just uh, seeing, uh, they they are seeing sending data to this data set, not uh, you know uh, specifically sending data to this uh, uh, pop sub topic in this pillar. We have some this uh, abstraction of routing and uh, data sending layer. Uh, so then uh, another point is like we do the on the Y compression before publishing data to pops up. This could help us save traffic like 70% uh, uh, and to 80%. Uh, this is actually saving a loss, a lot on our bandwidth. And if you know the pops up uh, chargeback model, it will also save, uh, you know, 70% or 80% on top uh, for, uh, for, uh, on that. So uh, then the next is our uh, 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 processor layer. For the processor layer, uh, it also integrated with our uh, metadata management. Uh, we have one beam job uh, per, uh, and a pop up uh, subscription for per day set, per destination. Um, uh, and it has used different services support. 
uh, it will take care of the schema conversions and the dy dynamic, dynamically load the schemas for transmo uh, tr tr transformation. And we are using the airflow uh, to, uh, to do orchestration. Um, and uh, uh, our biggest, uh, uh, our, uh, our did beam job, for example, pops out to big query one, it could handle up to 20 gigabytes per second uh, uh, based on the test. Um, so this is uh, our processors. Uh, and uh, uh, for us, we because we have hundreds and thousands uh, level of DSS, so it means we will have uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, beam jobs. So we use Airflow to do the orchestration. Uh, uh, um, our metadata management system, uh, based on the configuration for this set, uh, it will uh, get the data into the uh, our class cloud SQL database, and from that we we, we got some uh, uh, Airflow uh, logic to generate a master DAG, and the master DAG will start a lot of child jobs. Uh, uh, now we have. Uh, uh, for every data flow job, it is a child deck, and we have, uh, like I said, like a hundreds to thousand level uh, 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 child deck. So this is our orchestration layer. Uh, then the next, I want to uh, talk about uh, our use of different function. Uh, I think we had mentioned this concept a few times, but now uh, I want to do a refresher of memory and dive deep into it. So first, why do we need the use of different function? Uh, uh, we found that it's actually hard for users to write a beam job, and it's, uh, it's also hard to maintain the job. So for example, if I'm a user from the data science team, I just want to get all the direct message related data. Uh, I want to get it from the pub sub to BigQuery. Now I have to learn what is P collection, what is P transform, uh, how do I do the, the shuffle, uh, before ingestion to BigQuery, how do how uh, how should I do the schema conversion? Uh, this is actually kind of uh, too complex for some users, and even users finish writing the job, it is not easy for users to maintain the job. They have to take care of the environment issue like uh, 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 read permission, write permission, quotas, these things. Uh, just for some users, this is not easy. And uh, there's some need to do, uh, and uh, they have to do it if they want to do some, uh, you know, lightweight transformation. So we, so we, uh, so because of these reasons, so we uh, uh, do want to provide a user defense function to users. We want to make it uh, managed and serverless, uh, uh, and we want to we want to also support a SQL in our user defense functions. So uh, let's uh, see how it works. For users, it's actually easy to use the user different function. They only uh, need to implement the, the uh, our interface and checking the data in the source, and that's it. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, under the hood, uh, we got a system to pack their data into a jar and uh, uh, invoke the jar as a, a step in a in a beam deck. Uh, and uh, take care of the schema conversion uh, and the 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 our related issues. Uh, it, it's just like a manager to users. Uh, it's also serverless uh, to users. Just just implement it and check in. Uh, so uh, here I list the example. This is come from a, a real example. For example, is if you use use tweet apps, which collect a lot of data. Uh, and if you want to uh, filter out the direct message related data, in the past you might to uh, you you might write an ETL job to write to read from the data which is like uh, tens of terabytes per per hour, uh, and uh, you know write a scaling job or beam job to handle it and write a big query GCS something like that. It's actually not easy, but for now, what you need to do is just implement the interface. We, all, we will provide the interface and deserialize the data as the uh, well done swift uh, uh, object, which is the app event. And uh, users, they only need to, you know, uh, first uh, do the filter if you see the type is the direct message related. Uh, if it's not direct message related, they just skip it, just return empty, it will be skipped. If they find that this is direct, uh, direct message related data, then they could do their, uh, their they could uh, 
do the extraction, get the fields they want. They want they, then they could enrich the data with you know some tasks like uh, uh, the the data producer and some uh, uh, our PDB requirements. Then return it. Um, so this is a real example. Uh, this example shows uh, you know we input one event, uh, you could skip it and return one event. But if you want to return multiple events, that's also supported. But because of time li limited, I, I, I don't have got an example for that uh, here. So this is how the use dependent function works. Um, another very important thing is how do you update your, the use dependent function. So it's actually also pretty easy. It's as same as you update any code in your Git repo source. Just uh, you know, change your code, uh, test it, and make a fabricator. Uh, fabricator is our review or two. Uh, then after it's review, reviewed, uh, after it's landed. We got a system to automatically update uh, the your user defined function uh, with the git commit ID. So um, that's uh, I talk about UDF. The next uh, I want to go to our beam job optimization. Uh, we uh, um, uh, we had uh, done a multiple optimization to our beam job. One thing is we uh, we uh, collaborated with the Google Dataflow engine team and uh, remove shovel for PubSub to BigQuery. Injection and this uh, option could serialize the data, the resource, the CPU and memory resource used for purpose up to bigquery injection, you know, like 80 to 86 uh, percent. And then now the feature is uh, also in the Beam uh, uh, 2009. I, I forgot the version, but it's uh, the, the version is in, pub in public uh, Beam release. Uh, the second is like uh, we do the data compression uh, uh, before publishing data to PubSub, uh, and this compression, uh, this uh, this optimization also help a lot. Uh, after this uh, optimization, if we just look at a beam, the data flow into beam uh, as a source uh, already decreased like eighty percent, or even uh, uh, even larger. Though so you have to decompress it on the beam workers. But we also we still observe that the decrease in the resource like twenty percent, maybe sometimes even uh, even bigger. Yeah, for for some for some schemas. Uh, the third is like uh, we optimize our our schema conversion logic. Uh, at Twitter, also probably mentioned the loss of data we come into Swift. It's uh, Swift and the T binary serialized. Uh, now we just convert to every row. Then we have to convert to. A big table rule to do to ingest to BigQuery, and we also done multiple work to to optimize this. So uh, um, uh, for the future work for the log ingestion part, uh, we want to continue to the job optimization. We want to continue to info, uh, improve our performance. We want to improve our use of different function. For example, support a chain of uh, use of different functions. Uh, and a multiple destination support. We want to continue to improve our user uh, experience, for example, the UI. And also we want to have the percentage metrics like the P95 latency uh, for the beam job in uh, each step. This is something we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are talking with Google and I think Google is working on it. Yeah. Um, we also want to have a more destination support like a Druid uh, big table. So uh, that's about the log injection. Uh, at last, I want to do a recap. <laughs> so uh, in this slide, we talk about the uh, two systems. First is log injection, you know, collecting data from our apps and others. This is usually the beginning of the journey for the analytics. And uh, we provide a streaming support with the spare project. Um, then we also, talk, uh, we also talk about DRM for the data replication, uh, uh, data replication and the movement. Uh, we got the arm to bridge uh, the, the the data movement between our different analytics system and also online serving system uh, uh, databases like k value storage hdfs gcs bigquery and uh, yeah, during this process i think uh, beam really helped a lot uh, it's a unified model help us uh, you know could take take care of both and streaming uh, you know in one model this is great and for the uh, besides the API and the uh, Beam, it also supported the on-prem running environment and the cloud uh, environment. This is also a perfect fit for uh, uh, exactly what we need. 
So if we say Beam take care of the data processing uh, challenges for us, then our uh, own metadata management system uh, take care of uh, you know uh, the um, the metadata manager thing and data the discovery thing. It's like uh, we this uh, metadata management make it uh, uh, our data set concept is independent of uh, uh, PubSub uh, or our on prem from aggregators to make it uh, uh, transparent and make it work for uh, both on prem and the cloud and make it easier for users to transform and avoid the vendor login. So let's say in the future, if we want to try Pops Light or some other system with the metadata management system, we could easily to do it. So besides that, we also talk about the user defined function. Uh, with it, we could make a user's life much easier if they want to do some lightweight transformation by the beam, uh, writing, uh, composing, and maintaining is hard for them. So we provide uh, user development. Uh, thank you, folks. I guess uh, that's all.